Um, I've been asked to speak about the orphan spirit because we deal with this quite often in a freedom session. So today we're not really talking about what you would say when somebody would bring to you the question, well, what's an orphan? It's not a child in a faraway country that doesn't have a home. This is different. This is a person that has a, a spirit and a heart that ha is orphaned. And so what we're gonna talk about today, and I gave you a handout to you if you wanna take some notes, and it's all gonna be about uh, the definition of an orphan spirit, the characteristics, and how do we heal an orphan spirit. So first of all, we're gonna talk about where did the origin, where, what is the origin of the orphan spirit? You need a sheet? Right there. Oh, you don't either? Okay. Okay, well, I, I appreciated one catchphrase I caught this morning from Chris, and it was, you know, you, you need one too? Yeah, gotcha. The catchphrase that uh, Chris said this morning, we, we have to know the beginning before we can know the end. We have to go back to the beginning. We talk a, a lot about what's going to happen in the end, but we have to go back to where this actually originated. And it actually originated in the garden. The first orphan was Lucifer. He was banished from his position in the spiritual realm. And his primary goal going forward was to make everyone and anyone a version of himself. Disinherited, lost, and fatherless. The goal was to get the separation between the father and his children. And so, the, namely, his first children were Adam and Eve. And he wanted to destroy that relationship from the get-go. But God said, no, I have a plan for mankind. And mankind will exist for, by, and through me, the Father, who is love and who will be their father forever. So Adam was the first of the human sons of God. And it was Adam who had the face-to-face -face encounter with the perfect father. In other words, the father's love brought Adam to life. Adam knew the father's voice, he knew the touch of the father, and he experienced the first emotion of love from the father. Adam was protected, cared for, and provided. He didn't know any different, it was a perfect scenario. But the Bible then tells us that God created Eve and he created her because he wanted family. The garden was a home God, a home God created for his first son and daughter and it was a home because it was a connection between father and children in Genesis 1, 28. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey the father, they began to think independently apart from the father. The bond they had was broken between the father and his son and daughter. So you can see there was an immediate separation. They listened to the devil and they began to question the father's good plan for their life. They were self separated from the family and they are now known as orphans. That's in Genesis 3, 11. However, the father had a plan in spite of this disobedience. He gave everyone that was created from that time forward to be reconciled and joined back to the family of God when Jesus died on the cross. Christians were joined back to God when they were saved. And in Romans 8, 15, 17, it says, we have received the spirit of adoption to which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit and we are the children of God. In 2 Corinthians 6.18, it says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Although scripture tells us what happened at salvation, some Christians choose to live in an orphan lifestyle because they don't understand that there's any other alternative lifestyle to live in. So let's begin with what is the definition of an orphan spirit now that we know where it started. 
Symptoms for the orphan spirit are a person whose heart is emotionally and physically closed. Orphans have a feeling of not belonging. They carry deep-seated sense of not sense of not being accepted, valued, understood, or loved. It's very, very, very common. The orphan's heart shuts down when a person doesn't feel loved and accepted by their parents. Okay, let me say, now I don't hear it at all. We can hear you. Okay. Um, the orphan's heart shuts down when the person does not feel loved and accepted by their parents or people that are in authority over them in the early years of their life or even later in life. Some people will not allow their heart to be available emotionally or spiritually because of unforgiveness, anger, resentment, fear of rejection when they get older. This is a choice an adult makes to be spiritually and emotionally closed. But if you're talking about a child, when a child closes his heart, they don't know any different because they're a child. They're only seeing and believing what they're taught and modeled. When a child, again, believes they're not loved or feels rejected from an earthly father, they will struggle with the understanding of the love of a heavenly father. <coughs> It's just they, they just can't understand how a Heavenly Father can love them when their own father didn't love them in the first place. And their identity is challenged, and we know that your identity is only found in Christ and not from emotional hurt from people. The more they are rejected as children and adults, the more difficult it is to love and to forgive. Without the spirit of adoption, humanity is captive to the father of lies. Satan. Satan is a liar and deceiver who seeks to imprison individuals into a cycle of legalism, shame, fear, pain, anger, and rebellion. Typical symptoms. We understand how Satan can do this with non-Christians. Of course, they're not believers who don't have the spirit of adoption in their lives, but how can Satan do it with Christians? Isn't that interesting? We have to make the differentiation between the non-believer and the believer. Satan tells them lies as well, and he uses trauma like sickness, divorce, an absent father in the home, and other emotional experiences as his entry point. Our souls are affected and we feel captive to our childhood and adult experiences. In other words, Satan will try to get you to believe your past will dictate your future. How many of you have ever thought of that before? He tries to tell you this is your future. Now get over it because this is what's happened in the past. It's called a soul issue. This is what it is. So let me explain further. People who have experienced extreme rejection in their lives, wounds in the church, trauma through verbal or physical acts, abandonment, abuse, neglect, can feel like orphans. You feel like you don't belong because of what's happened to you. It's been so traumatic. Very often something has happened in a person's Christian life, such as a church split, Offenses, false judgments, lies, and relational trauma. And then Satan will use that emotional circumstance to override the father's love. He reminds them of their past that cannot be changed, reconciled, or forgiven. Hence, the bondage of the past will drive people to seek unhealthy relationships, drugs, sexual experiences, gender identity, and many alternate alternatives to soothe the emotional pain. 
They feel like the choices they have made are unforgivable. So they continue to feel condemned and Satan makes sure that they feel separated from their heavenly father who loves them conditionally. So you can see how he uses different situations for wherever you're at to separate you from God. The orphan spirit is an unhealed heart. It's often fostered by a lot of, by lack of biblical parenting. Quite often, people are afraid to reach out for fear of being rejected. You won't understand what I've been through. How often have you heard that? I've been through something nobody's been through. We hear that often. The absent father, working parents, and dysfunction in the house and home make biblical truth difficult to reconcile in their minds when the home is not teaching biblical principles or living a biblical lifestyle. It happens a lot. Orphans have a feeling of, again, not belonging. They carry a deep-seated sense of not being accepted wherever they go in whatever situation they're in. They don't feel valued, honored, understood, or loved. So I'm gonna give you some real practical experiences that we all hear that I'm sure when I get finished telling you what they are, you're gonna go, hmm, I've had some of those in the past, or maybe you know somebody that is dealing with this. So here are some of the spiritual acts and some of the characteristics that you'll see, that we see in freedom sessions. They're very performance, oriented people. They would rather have rules than relationship. They feel that God doesn't love or care about them even though they believe in the Bible and the truth about what the word says who they are. They find it very difficult to maintain close relationships. They're like, you can be my friend, but you can only go just so far. They blame others for things that are happening to them and they do not like to take responsibility. Blame is much easier than to accept responsibility for their part. They run away from problems. They reject authority. They're critical of other people and they're full of envy, anger, and they want to control every situation they're in. They think that makes them secure. They desire the praise of man, and they want to be seen for what they do. They make choices based on fleshly, fleshly desires, needs, and emotional desires. Brain balance is a necessity and they may choose harmful things to feel settled. Now, let me explain that a little bit. We've heard this in, now remember there's different spirits for different situations. I'm just talking one specific spirit today, the orphan spirit. So when there is a trauma of other kinds, your brain is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing that God's created. We really don't ever forget things. We either stuff them or we challenge ourselves to just forget them and say, I can overcome this by myself. But when there's things that have happened in your brain and you can't tell anybody about it because of shame and guilt, then you look for things to balance your brain so you can just live, okay? For example, this isn't the open spirit, but it's a state of such trauma in a person's life. I'm just gonna, it could be a sexual experience, molestation or whatever. And a person has no one to tell that to. Or they have nothing to tell, no one to tell a childhood experience like we're talking now. Their brain is looking for some type of balance that they can emotionally live with it so they can go on in their daily activities. So that in order to do that, they look for things outside of God that are not healthy. They won't ever satisfy them, but it's a temporary fix. And that's the problem. And they can go on for years with it. So that's what I call brain balance. It's just finding that balance where I can live what's happened to me 
and I can still go on my day-to-day -day activities and act like I'm act like I'm normal. So we're going to maybe need more on that. I can answer that later. Why do some Christians experience these traumatic things and not become orphans, while others do become orphans? Okay, I'm going to say that again. Why do some Christians experience these traumatic things in their life and they're not, they don't become orphans while others do become orphans? Well, the reason is because they don't know their identity. That's all we talk. It's like a record. Knowing your own identity. When a person's identity is so connected with the father that nothing can separate him or her, Satan can't make them believe the orphan lies because they know who they are. So when the enemy tempts them with a lie, say, no, that's not who I am. This is who Jesus says I am. And you're not going to tell me anything different because I know it's a lie. Satan is the one who attaches to the wound to use it or make the person feel separated from the Father's love or other Christians' love. In other words, this is a spiritual battleground. So how do we help free a person from the orphan spirit? That's what we ultimately want. The goal is to establish their identity as a son and daughter of the Father. We want to reconcile that relationship that's been broken long ago in the garden. So how do we um, do this? How do we heal the orphan spirit? Well, anyone who's ever had a freedom session most likely doesn't have their identity as a son and daughter from the father, and Satan has made them all orphans. When they're in a freedom session, the intake form will often reveal their separation from the father, and they have an orphan spirit. You can recognize it pretty quickly. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest areas that separates a person from their identity. It's huge. And we can say we forgive people, but it's it's really something that needs to be healed, not just spoken like I, I've forgiven him. If they need to forgive, we recognize the orphan spirit using this experience to separate. He uses this to separate them as a son and daughter. We lead through, lead them through steps of forgiveness. We have them verbally forgive the person or persons who have created the trauma. We ask them to verbally bless that person or persons begin, to begin the healing. One of the key steps that they uh, then repent for is having that wound hanging on to them for their whole life and not forgiving the person. This breaks the sin on their part and Satan no longer has access to their soul in the area of, this, of their lives. So we break that spirit we, we get them to forgive, we get them to bless, and then we ask them to repent for their part in their unforgiveness. You let them know they're forgiving and clean and that Satan can no longer hurt them in this area. You can command the orphan spirit to leave, and when you do that, Satan has lost his power and there is no longer a stronghold in their life. Another example is low self-esteem, very typical of an orphan spirit. There's many, but these are just two examples. They don't feel good about themselves, and they often don't feel accepted. So in other words, their identity as a son and daughter of a loving father is broken, and they act again like an orphan, trying to make their own way, whatever way they can. Sexual abuse, abandonment, lack of love, marital problems, divorce, eating disorders. All of these are symptoms of the orphan spirit. All of these behaviors can be symptoms of the root of the trauma. You know, the difference of a symptom is the outside, the root is what's inside that's causing the symptom in the first place. We call this inner healing from the orphan spirit and other areas have different spirits that you'll deal with too that drives a person again to be separated from the father. And one last point, at the end of the freedom session, we, John and I have always done this, we bless them with a blessing that they are no longer 
an orphan and separated from the father. They are welcomed back into the family and they're no longer alone. They are now rejoined to the father and his unconditional love. So these are just, I'm giving you just kind of an overview because this is just one spirit. I can give you just one last example of somebody I did not too long ago. And I don't have this very often, but I couldn't get this person to start off forgiving somebody. I said, I, I just don't know if I can do this. They, they weren't very old, I wanna say maybe 30. And I said, well, you have to do this in order to go forward. And I explained why. And then the person said, okay, I can do this. But it's what I said, the longer this goes on in their life, the harder it is for them to forgive. So it's good we can get younger people to do this so that they can actually forgive sooner and their life can be free going forward. But I did get her to forgive, but she had almost checked, every check mark checked on the intake form. And we went through every single step and most of it was the orphan spirit. But the good news is there's healing for this. And one good thing when you ask them after you're doing some of this inner healing, you say, how are you feeling? You know what the response is? I feel light. I feel like a weight has been lifted off of me. And that's because that's the ball and chain they've been carrying around for years. We understand it, but they don't. And they are now beginning to experience freedom that Jesus died to give them. And that's what it's all about. And so we want to bring that, that separating spirit that has caused them to be orphans back to the family of God, where they are a part now of his family again, and they are no longer separated. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Well, you listen to their story as soon as you hear them come in and you have their intake form and then you, you listen to the story and they usually start out with where it all started. And, and Ken will say a lot of times when people are adults, that I mean older adults, they say, well, when did this start? That's typically where he says, where did this start in your life? Because for some people, it wasn't in as childhood, it was a hurt later on in life, church hurt, things like that, relationship, divorce, whatever. So it happened later on. So it's good in that case, it'd be good to say, where did it start? But if it's a young person, they always start at their childhood. Most common. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Good, that means you all understand. <laughs> okay, I want to turn it over to my husband and he's going to talk about generation blessings, which we do at every conference. And we do in restaurants, we do it everywhere we go. People see us coming and they go, I wonder if you're going to give me a blessing. And he always does. Uh, it's, uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because at the end of a generational blessing, we, we, we bring them back into the family of God. Uh, let me make a comment about the, the orphan spirit. We call it a spirit. And so is there a spirit under every rock? You know, and so, and there are deliverance where we know there can be an actual spirit of lust and we see people you cast it out and we see them manifest and everything so sometimes watch our terminology and we're weak in our terminology sometimes they are which is wounded you know any of these things separate us from our true identity as a son or daughter of the father anything that separates us from that true identity that's the enemy of our soul trying to rob, kill, steal, and destroy us. So we know this is Satan working on, he'll work on our soul and he'll work in an area of, of an injury, something that happened to us, trauma that he affixes to, to try to pull us from the Father's love, from our identity. Some, of, some people have walked through severe trauma, car accidents, spouse dying instantly of a heart attack, da da da, you name it, many traumas in life, and they maintain their identity with the Father. They can grieve, be hurt, and all these things, but, but Satan doesn't 
pull them out and go out oh, nuts. Now, why did God do this to me? And they kind of separate from the church, separate from others. So many Christians don't separate. But those who come to freedom sessions are those who haven't been able to overcome it or doesn't he, they don't even recognize what has been going on that satan has been satan has been using the traumas and the impacts the evil that that is in the world using that in their lives to pull them away from their confidence in who they are as a son or daughter and so most of our freedom sessions whether it's inner healing or actual deliverance are, are dealing with that so when we say when we say uh, freedom spirit we will at times in i know some of our freedom sessions whatever certain issues we will actually call out the freedom or the uh, orphan spirit in the name of jesus christ i would command you now to leave in jesus name because we sense there is such a demonic attack from that area other times i just feel they've been wounded mm -hmm. and and it's not this spirit that just has grabbed them that we have to remove when when especially like in on forgiveness if they if they in the steps of forgiveness they forgive themselves they forgive the other person they bless the other person then they repent which is their part after the after the unforgiveness when we're, they remove the sin from their own lives because they said bad things about the person or they judge the person when they repent of that satan has no hold on them satan will hold an area of 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 unbelief that's the area so when they repent of when they repent in the forgiveness, I say to them, as a minister of the gospel, which you all are, your sins are forgiven. And the Lord sees that no more, and Satan has no hold on your life. Be free in Jesus' name. And they'll hear that, and they will feel different. They will act differently. You'll see that. I know in the freedom team, we've all seen that. On the healing team, it's easy. You can do the same thing. You, you see... You see, there's there's something going on, and the and the Holy Spirit mentions to you unforgiveness. You can get rid of that in five minutes. I mean, can I help you with that? Will you do this with me? Now I'm not taking over what Pam's telling, Paul's telling. I'm just saying we can do these things. This isn't rocket science. Trust the Holy Spirit. There are some ways of doing it that are quicker and better, but we can do all this. Um, I had I was wounded in in for years for like 30 years i carried a church wound and i felt separated from the body of christ i'd be in other churches where i lived all over the nation i never fit in i felt like i'm there i mean i, I was participating in church but i never fit in and you know my story the father actually had to come up and hug me and i actually saw this wound that i didn't know i had that from i've been wounded by a, a, someone in the church many years ago i actually saw it leave which I wasn't used to seeing either, but I felt his hug and I had my identity as a son of the father. Then some things that have happened in my life since then, which I would have strongly reacted to just as they had 30 years earlier, they didn't impact me. I had some of the same things happen to me from some people. And, it, and I went, wait a second. I, I'd be hurt, but in a few hours I'd go, I know that person though, they love God. And, and, it, and Satan could affix his, himself on my soul. So the biggest thing in any freedom session, all we're doing is bringing them back into their identity, right? That's all we're doing. We're just bringing them back into their identity as the son or God of the Father. Okay, I'm gonna talk one more thing and that's about generational blessings. And we just passed out a form that I passed out to the 50 plus who generational who do generational blessings. The first thing that I did when when the Lord put this mantle on me for 50 plus was uh, after about six months after that happened, after my wife went to heaven and, and Patty Lutz asked me, do you want to keep 50 plus going? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, and then I said, yes. And she said, well, tell us what we'll do. And I was with about 60, 70, 50 plusers and I was clueless. I said, we'll, we'll socialize for six months, then we're going to minister. Well, in that six months time, after that six months, the, the school and the university called us up, 50 plus years up to pray for them. And the Lord gave me the idea of how to bless. You know, yes, there are books on blessing and everything, but this was me. So I wrote out generational blessings. Now, so I just want to talk about that because another thing we get to do, boy, I hate these podiums, <laughs> you know, I'm a walker. Uh, another thing we get to do 
is bless people. And all of you can bless people. We are called to be blessers. And you can do this with your children. You can do this tomorrow night when you have that young couple over. You just pronounce a blessing over them. I'm just going to give you a few steps of how we do it. Uh, and you and you can simplify or just have it in your mind. I mean, when we're at a restaurant, very often I'll bless the, I'll bless the uh, server, and and I'll say, you know, put your fist on mine. Do you mind if I give you a blessing? No one has ever rejected a blessing. If I'd say, do you mind if I pray for you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but no, you go like that, and you just kind of connect with them, and you just and the Lord will just speak a blessing to them, even you. Sometimes you'll sense they know the Lord, you can speak something, and other times you know they don't, but you can speak a blessing of, of what's coming into their lives from daddy, you know, into their lives. Okay, so if you're doing this more formally as we do at the conferences, um, we let them know what a generational blessing is, how and God blessed Adam and Eve, you know, be fruitful and multiply, and we have like seven or eight examples. David blessed Solomon before Solomon became king, and he blessed him with wisdom, and he became the wisest king ever on earth, etc., etc. So we can rattle off blessings and name blessings and show how important it is in the word. And then, then we'll get to know them. But when you do a blessing here, I just want to give you a couple keys. And one of those, I've got to say here, <laughs> one of those is to have them keep their eyes open. This isn't a prayer. Just look in their eyes. Right? And if you, but Tell them what you want. Tell them what you want to do, and tell them how how important this was to the father that he even blessed Adam and Eve, and the patriarchs blessed their children. And parents in the Lord always bless younger people or, or their children. And we just because because I love you, I want to just call a blessing over your life. So you just say keep your eyes open, and and if you want to touch them, just like in a freedom session, get permission. You know, when we have it at conferences will ask could I touch your forehead or or touch your hand you know and usually they say yes sometimes they say no and they have some good reasons for saying that and so you respect you really just respect them in that um, then now if you're with a partner and what the Lord had me do is put a man and a woman together when we can because when we have people coming at conferences um, we don't know what happened in their lives and very often very often they've never been blessed and they've desired a blessing of the Father. Or they've desired love and blessing and acceptance from their parents, and it could be from the mother. And maybe the mother had rejected them. And so, so when we do it together, we have a man and a woman, we'd have the man give a blessing and the woman give a blessing. And so, because we don't know the people, and two together are better than one anyway. So if you want to do it with somebody else, it doesn't have to be a male and female. I'm just saying this is how we do it at conferences. Um, so, so we give them a blessing. And the blessings are prophetic. But you don't stop and give them a prophetic word. If you give them a prophetic word, you just gave them a prophetic word. Give them a blessing. You don't even have to explain the whole blessing. You don't have to give them the word, interpret the word, blah, 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 with the word, and go 22 minutes with the word. A blessing can be one word. I bless you with light. And the Holy Spirit will reveal what that means. And maybe the Lord is already talking to them about being a light in their neighborhood or whatever. I mean, it will be prophetic. And it will sound so simple. You're going, this can't be a prophetic word. It's too simple. You know, so forget Satan's lies. You know, just go, oh, but it sounds too simple. This is probably God because God wants to be simple and help to clarify this. So it'll be so simple in that. So I'm going to do a blessing because I'm going, okay, I'm going to have to illustrate. Come on, Donna, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm just going to model it real fast. But don't let me forget to talk about orphan spirit because I want to get, that's why I'm here to talk about that. So you know what a blessing is, you know. Mm -hmm. God bless Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, boy, there's a story of uh, David, just before he turned the throne over to his son Solomon, he blessed him and he blessed him with wisdom and he became the wisest man on earth. Mm -hmm. And if you read the Gospel of Luke, the last couple of verses of the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke, it says, when Jesus was ascending to heaven, he stretched out his hands as he's going up. 
and he blessed his followers. So I, as just as, as your brother in Christ, I just want to pronounce a blessing over your life. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? Now, I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> Most of the time, I don't know what I'm going to say. Sometimes when they walk up to you, you see somebody, you will, you have a word. You'll know what they're going to say. Most of the time, I will, I'll ask them, may I touch you on the forehead or your hand? And when I touch them, something will come to me. So right now, I'm telling you right now, I know nothing. <laughs> okay, I seriously, I know nothing. So you mind if I bless you? Could sure. I touch you on the forehead? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to keep your eyes open. This is not prayer. We're just going to, I'm just going to speak a blessing to you. I bless you with relationships where the cords are not easily broken. I bless you with a new security in all our relationships in your life. Amen. So now, now what? I mean, I've never given that blessing before. I've never, almost every, every time, I can't recall ever giving him the same blessing twice. I've never said that in a blessing in my life. I mean, I just saw... I just saw the cord when I when I looked at her when I was about to bless her, and so when when we bless a person when we're at a conference or something, very often at a conference these are Christians. Most most Christians are wounded yet, right? They come to conferences because they want life. They know they're wounded. They don't know what it is, but but they want to get healed. So when they when you bless them, then then at the end we'd stand with them. If it's a man and a woman, perhaps a woman would hug them or something, and we just say. And we, yeah, I see, I see, it's true, isn't it? Yes, see, it is God, it's God. And so, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So, we break off the orphan spirit in your life. Any way Satan was trying to separate you from the Father's love and the family of God. We say Satan is, an, is a liar, and we say, Satan, you have no authority over Donna. We join with her as a brother and sister in the body of Christ never again to feel outside. You are always inside with us in the family together forever in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, and so, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how it's, I mean, that's how it's done. And especially when, when you do it with someone else, uh, other Christians, Christians don't know how to have relationship. They want to be in relationship. I mean, the people in the freedom, people who are coming for freedom sessions are all separated. And it's, so it's so important at the end of a freedom session, just to, just to let them know, you are now a son and daughter of the Father. He loves you. We stand with you. We are your brother and sister. And we love you together. You are the inside and Satan never can have a hold on your life in any area anymore because your identity is with daddy so at the end of every generational blessing the final act will be to remove the sense of being orphaned we can call it orphan spirit or the sense of being orphaned anytime you're se you're separated from your identity as a son or daughter of the father you're acting orphaned and so when we're talking about orphan spirit sometimes if we're just talking inner healing just say they feel orphaned okay now, sometimes there's an orphan, the orphan spirit that in freedom you can command in the name of Jesus to be moved in this life. There are all kinds of things you can do in freedom sessions, cut off soul ties, blah, 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 blah. We're just talking about this one area. Okay? Any questions on, on that? So go out and bless people. So you saw how easy it was. So others, even in the body here, you know, when you send someone at, coming to church, you just send someone that just needs some love who's sitting at the table or whatever, and maybe you've just met him or something. Hey, you just look great. Can I bless you? Look at my eyes. You know, God bless Adam and Eve. Da 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 da. I just want to pronounce a blessing. And so help me, a word will come to you. Now, notice how short that blessing was, right? It was just, just a word. But, but it is, what is a blessing? It's pronouncement of what the future holds for them. That's what that is. You're going to, that's what it is. So it's boom, just one little thing. Okay. Oh, I had one more, th I had one more thought. Okay, so one more thing. Um, this morning, when, uh, I, was it Chris? 
was speaking. Yeah, when Chris was speaking, did you hear that? Did you hear a person just crying out and moaning and wailing? And did you hear that person? There was a person like that last week too, and I went, oh, I should have gone and found out what was going on. Well, this person ended up, they were on the third floor. I mean, and they were just, they were, I guess, standing at the railing or something, just crying out, and it was just, just coming over the people, everybody, I was looking around, where where in the world is this person? So John D. Bonick went out investigating. So I'm, I'm roaming around in the pit area, uh, the lower atrium area, and uh, the well, and um, and they weren't there. And, and they said that someone said, oh, they're up there. So so they were they were actually on the third floor and they'd been standing at the railing and just, they're, help me Jesus. And she was just crying out and crying out. I got to the third floor to see is this demonic or what is this? And here's this woman on the floor. She's just, now she's on the floor and she's just crying, oh Jesus. Oh Yeshua, I love you, oh Jesus. The Holy Spirit was just on her and she didn't, she was just overwhelmed. She didn't know how to respond. And so she was very emotional and she was just crying out and she was on the floor and her three children were by her. And she was just lying on the floor. So I just lay down next to her, just covered her and prayed with her and just loved her. And just just, just let her feel accepted and loved and it's okay and we're together. Now, if it were demonic, we would have done something totally different. Now the point is, if I did it, you can do it. When, when you see someone now who's gonna be coming in and they're coming in and and, and they're overwhelmed. They can be overwhelmed because they've been, I remember once I was at a Todd Bentley meeting in Oregon when he was a young man and I still carried my wound. I went to the, I went to the altar one night and I was like that woman on the third floor crying out, yeah, I didn't know what's wrong with me. I didn't know I had this big wound that I couldn't get rid of and I was trying to be close to Jesus. And I was like that woman crying out. No one came and said, that's okay, let's find out what's wrong with you. I just ended up still carrying it after I left. <laughs> well, hey, so daddy hugged me later on. You guys all have authority right. to love each other, to comfort each other. When you see someone who, if they're really emotional crying out, you can just stand with them and put your arm with them and just kind of settle their spirit a little that they feel accepted and loved and in the family. And maybe the Lord will have you pray for them or whatever. That's what we are going to be doing and what we get to do, whether we're in healing sessions, freedom sessions, or just love sessions, just bringing them in. And that's it. I'm done. Amen. Thank you, John and Sandy. I think that was some really awesome things for us to take in as a freedom team but as, and as a healing team because um, there's a lot of people that will show up for the healing teams that will never make an appointment with the freedom teams. And so we can do, you know, we can bless them. We can break off that orphan spirit. You know, God can do mighty transformation in just a small period of time. 